WNOX AM FM, Loudon, Knoxville. 12 past the hour of 6 o'clock. It's my pleasure to welcome to the broadcast this morning Dr. Kenneth Miller. He's a professor of biology at Brown University. His book is entitled Finding Darwin's God, a scientist's search for common ground between God and evolution. He's in town tonight. But let me ask you this. As a cellular biologist, when in your experience are you studying something or reading something or doing some research when do you come to the point where you go, that's God? As an experimental scientist, I don't find God in the insufficiency of science to explain things. In other words, I don't find God in ignorance. I don't find God because we say, well, we can't explain that. That must be something that God's doing. But what did God do? Did he just create some kind of primordial soup and say, go? Well, a long time ago, people were sufficiently unknowing of how things worked in the natural world to see when the sun moved across the sky, they imagined that God had to push that sun across the sky. And, and gradually, we began to realize that the world works according to physical laws. Science investigated those laws. Um, so what room is there for God in, in present-day life? Well, I think if you ask people uh, who are believers, how does God act? They would say he acts in a variety of ways. He answers our prayers. He inspires us. Uh, no doubt there are events that take place that are part of what some people might call God's plan. And what I would suggest is if you look back in Earth's history, if God is working today in concert with the laws of nature, with physical laws and so forth, he probably worked in concert with them in the past. In a sense, in a sense he's the guy who made up the rules of the game and he manages to act within those rules. For Miller and millions of followers of all major religions, notions of God and evolution are fully compatible. But not everyone agrees. When we replace the traditional idea of God, the creator, with the idea of the process of natural selection doing the creating. The creation is as wonderful as it ever was. All that great design work had to be done. It just doesn't, wasn't done by an individual. It was done by this huge process distributed over billions of years. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Whereas people used God to think of meaning say, coming from on high and being ordained from the top multiply. down. Now we have Darwin saying, no, all of this design can happen, all of this purpose can emerge from the bottom up without any direction at all. And that's a very unsettling thought for many people. In Darwin's day, science and politics and religion were all of a piece when you talked about the origins of life and of species. Astronomy could go along pretty well because it testified to the wisdom and power of God in holding the planets in place. But the idea of evolution or transmutation, people said with a snarl, put in jeopardy the whole established social order. What is in this big book of his, do you think? Transmutation. <sighs> Another Darwin blotting God out of creation. We want to support your scheme for a museum of natural history. Some people see it as rash, extravagant, grandiose. If it's grand, it's because it should house as wide a display as possible. But we need your help in return. It is up to you, as the country's leading anatomist and paleontologist, to prove man's superiority. We won't have street ruffians tout man's monkey origin in Her Majesty's museums. You can rely on me, Bishop Wilberforce. The human brain differs markedly from that of all other mammals. In man, not only do the cerebral hemispheres overlap the olfactory lobes and the cerebellum, but they extend in advance of the one and farther back than the other. Their posterior development is so marked that I have assigned to that part the character of a third lobe, peculiar to Homo sapiens. The Hippocampus Minor. 
peculiar mental faculties are associated with this highest form of brain. And I am led, therefore, to regard man not merely as representative of a distinct subclass, <laughs> but as the inhabitant of one reserved for him alone. The human brain is in itself proof of man's moral and religious faculties. Such are the powers with which we, and we alone, are gifted. I wonder what a chimpanzee would have to say about that, Mr. Huxley. I think it's priceless. His theory is a house built on sand, a Corinthian portico on cow dung. Yes. Damn all the sanctimonious meddlers who try and stifle troublesome research. The ultimate court of appeal of science is observation and experiment, not authority, wealth and rank. Your disagreements with Owen should not be personal. I can't help it. He's so pompous. The prospect of his slipping on one of his pickled brains is just too good to be true. Bad feeling will only cloud the issue and lead to bad science. Tell that to Owen. Huxley is saying in public what you think in private. Charles, you've stalled long enough. You've collected enough barnacles to sink a ship of the line. Meanwhile, you're being upstaged. That's not important. My book is the thing. Once my work is done... Will it deal with man? <sighs> it's too surrounded by prejudices. Well, whether it does or it doesn't, you must publish. Alfred Wallace. My dear Huxley. It's like a precy of my theory. All my originality, whatever it's worth, has been smashed. Had Wallace a copy of the essay I'd written in 44 in front of him, he couldn't have written a better short abstract. Variations being pushed further and further from parent species by a struggle for existence, overpopulation. It's all there. Is your book ready for publication? Publish? How can I publish? Honourably. I'd sooner burn the blasted thing and have him or anyone else think that I behaves in a paltry spirit than publish a joint paper, excerpts from your work along with Wallace's essay. And then you must prepare a manuscript for publication. Who knows, it may all be for the best. At last we'll finally get to learn your views in full. Miserable wretch, I'd be without you near me. <laughs> 